which is a good Absolutely. segue to talk about uh, one of your uh, recent uh, experiments uh, with Jimmy Moore <laughs> with, about like consuming high amounts of protein. So can you tell us like yeah. what, why did you do it and what, uh, what were the results? Yeah, yeah. We've got a lot of backlash for, um, for doing it. But um, so basically, uh, so Jimmy Moore and I are doing a podcast called the Keto Hacking MD Podcast. And, and what we're trying to show is that a ketogenic lifestyle is extremely important it's a basis for pretty much everything. But if you just do nutrition in a bubble and you don't start addressing other things in life, that modern life that are affecting us like sleep, stress reduction, exercise, that you're probably going to stall and not have the, the degree of success that you're looking for. So one of the experiments that we did was a three to one protein to fat ratio. So Dr. Ted Naiman sometimes will recommend for a short period of time for his uh, patients to do this kind of diet where you're basically trying to increase metabolism and um, lose you know, body fat. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted to test this theory because in the keto world right now, there is this question of is protein or fat really the predominant macronutrient that causes satiety? Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we've noticed is that with the advent of MCT oils and a lot of these shakes, people are starting to down you know, high levels of fat uh, calories in liquid form. Hmm. And yeah, they're getting ketones from the MCT, but is that actually really healthy and are they going to lose weight, which is a lot of uh, what people do keto for. Hmm. And so we wanted to see, okay, does protein cause satiety? Is there a negative outcome from doing a very high protein diet? So the three grams to one gram protein to fat ratio, and we basically eliminated carbohydrates to try to you know, get rid of that confounding variable. Hmm. In his protocol, he does recommend 30 grams of, of carbohydrates. So Jimmy Moore is on one scale, you know, um, still struggling with some weight loss, does have some uh, insulin resistance, and then on my end, you know, I have very low body fat percentage and no more insulin resistance. And so we wanted to see the, the d different range and what the response would be. So, and we documented this with blood ketone levels and a um, Freestyle Libre flash glucose monitor. So it's not continuous, you have to put the monitor over it, but I'm so OCD that I checked it every like two minutes. So I had a pretty good uh, documentation. And uh, before we started, I did a um, body impedance analysis. So I have a machine that does basically body fat percentage, lean muscle mass, water weight. And so my body fat percentage was about 8%. So I was very keto adapted. My initial ketone levels were very high in the fours. And my glucose usually ranges about 60 fasting in the morning. So what I noticed personally was that consuming that much protein, which for me was about 195 grams, um, and no fat essentially, or very little fat, about 60 grams of fat, mm -hmm. I had precipitous drop in my ketones, my glucose level started going up, and I felt really bad. Mm -hmm. And so I, I tell the story that before I became keto adapted, I would eat a meal, post meal I would have a hypoglycemic episode, I would have that postprandial stupor. I would feel horrible. And then I would be hungry 30 minutes later, which is classic, right? Since being keto for, you know, 13 years, um, I, I do not get that experience anymore. I do not get that postprandial stupor. And so when I started eating this way again, that's what happened. I started feeling kind of full, but not in the full sense where I feel keto adapted and I'm just at a good energy level. I had that kind of, you know, heavy stomach. And then afterwards, I would feel hungry 30 minutes later, and my um, appetite level actually increased. So I was hungry more frequently, and I was starting to think about food again. So I went the seven days, um, did add some lean body mass, about one, one and a half pounds, and did drop a little bit in terms of fat mass, although there is some variable degree of uncertainty with the test. So whether or not I actually did that, I don't know. But I felt like I had more muscle mass. But the takeaway for me was that I didn't like the way I felt again. So I didn't like feeling like I was always thinking about food. I was always hungry or having that postprandial stupor. Jimmy, on the other hand, had a much different experience where he became hypoglycemic very quickly and symptomatic from it with his blood glucose in the 50s, mm -hmm. still maintaining ketones in the 1 to 1.5 range. Um, he had to eat much higher levels of protein because of his um, lean body mass. He's 6'3", and he's a bigger guy. 
Um, but he had a pretty bad experience. And so I think what we were trying to show is that doing high, high protein may not be uh, a very safe thing if you have insulin resistance and possible uh, right. glucagon resistance as well. Right. Yeah. I think it's, so yeah. Kind of, I think like the reason why you experience this hypoglycemia and uh, hungriness is that you kind of kick yourself out of ketosis with consuming that much protein and that's going to trigger your body to go over into the sugar burning mode again. And because you're eating like zero, zero carbs and little to no fat, yep. then your body doesn't have access to any energy. And uh, basically Correct. that's going to cause like maybe even like muscle catabolism in some cases, I would believe. Yeah. And you get almost, it's, you know, it's called rabbit starvation, right? So the old um, kind of hunter gatherers knew this, that if they just ate protein by itself, high levels of protein, then they would feel bad, tired. But as soon as they started implementing fat into their diet, and if you do a one-to-one -one ratio, which is essentially ketogenic, mm -hmm. then that's, that's a different story. And you could probably consume a higher level of protein without having the impact like you know, I had or Jimmy had. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that I think um, is not talked about enough is that the hunter-gatherer society, they would eat mostly you know, the organ meats. They would eat the liver the adrenal glands the tongue the the parts of the animal that had you know the heart that had a lot of fat hmm. and then and, you know the, the lean muscle they would throw to the dogs so the it's important to have this ratio where you need fat and you need fat for you know hormone production for your brain for every function in the body but you also do need some protein and i think my takeaway from it the positive takeaway was that i've increased my protein intake a little bit i was probably underdoing it some yeah yeah i think like uh, there is a like, fear amongst keto people that don't eat too much protein because of gluconeogenesis right. and things like that but in reality it's not like a strict line where you if you surpass it even by an inch you're going to get kicked out of ketosis there's like a, quite a big buffer zone in the sense i could imagine you could consume like in your, I would, in your example, you were, you were saying you consume like 190 grams of protein every day. So I would yeah. suggest like maybe if you stay around 170 and 180, you can safely be always in this keto state all the time still. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, obviously taking into account, you know, exercise, you know, activity yeah. level, how much fat you're consuming. Um, you know, I do a BMR, so I know kind of my basic metabolic rate around what it is. I'm not trying to lose weight. I'm trying to maintain where I'm at. So I, I, I can get into a situation where I can calculate exactly how much I probably can consume. I've done this for so long that I don't need to calculate. And part of what I really like about it is that I know exactly what works for me. Um, so I don't have to sit there and do my macros and, and calculate um, unless I'm doing an experiment where then I kind of want to document, okay, this is what's happening. This is what I'm in, you know, consuming so that people understand, okay, this is what has changed. But yeah, I think protein, and it's still debated in, in um, the internet circles, and I think we're probably overdoing it in terms of how much debate we're doing. Um, <laughs> I think consume protein, you know, don't do 300 grams of protein. There's really no need for it. Yeah. Um, protein is not your enemy, um, you know, as long as you're consuming healthy fats with it. I, really think it's, I think it's much more healthier and much more effective to be focusing on eating these fattier chunks of meat and uh, mm -hmm. other, other animal sources rather than putting on extra MCT oil and extra butter right. on, on top of all of your foods because yeah, it promotes yeah. other you know, metabolic pathways that are associated with health and uh, lower body fat and uh, things like that. Yeah, and I think that's kind of... Um, part of what's what i mentioned earlier where with the um you know really push for mct products bulletproof coffee right, right. you know all these products which I'll, I'll be the first to say i i have some mct oil in my um, morning coffee right now i'm doing more of a matcha tea because i'm trying to get the hmm. antioxidants but you know you can have a little bit just don't make that your primary source of of nutrition and then skip on the protein because you want to stay in ketosis i think that's what we're seeing, and especially when you have keto becoming so popular, a lot of products coming to market, and that's the danger. And so I can understand from the protein camp of the guys like Keto Gains and who are promoting you know, more of a one-to-one -one diet that you, know, you need to have protein, don't skip out on the protein. Mm -hmm. um, and you see that also in the carnivore uh, diet that people are really starting to gravitate towards 
too, because that's essentially what they're doing, right? They're doing one to one ratio, fatty chunks of meat, getting the, the quality of meat. The other thing I'd like to say just on in terms of oils is that or fats is that, you know, we've been telling people that saturated fats are, are extremely dangerous, but we have to be careful now that we don't just do MCT based oils as our own source of fat. We need to have a, a wide range of, you know, saturated, polyunsaturated and unsaturated fats. Hmm. Yeah. And uh, I fear like there's definitely a lot of confirmation bias in in all camps of this discussion like especially sure. like the carnivore diet they're definitely gonna very yeah. oh yeah we're gonna we can eat a lot of more protein and we can eat more meat and stuff like that i love protein or you need only a certain amount of protein every day and any excess doesn't doesn't benefit you that much so protein rocks correct and and then you know the flip side is what about mTOR activation right. you know is there an issue in terms of longevity what about, um, you know, from an ecological standpoint, are we going to be consuming so much meat that it's becoming, you know, detriment to our yeah. uh, environment? So I personally, I'm not opposed to people saying I want to do carnivore versus a Western diet. If you had to choose between the two, carnivore hands down. Yeah. For me personally, I like a variety of foods. So mm -hmm. I like to have other foods in my diet. And so eating meat, uh, only me for the rest of my life I don't think I would like to do that mm. and I also like to think that uh, implementing these different plants and uh, herbs and vegetables they have like yeah. a much more net positive effect on your longevity and your gut microbiome and uh, things of that right. by you know making your making your metabolism more robust as well yeah. yeah and there are you know quite a bit of studies in terms of the gut microbe that you know, having healthy carbohydrates, healthy fiber is, is essential for them to survive and thrive. You know, people say, well, I'll just take a probiotic and that'll be the answer. And, and the reality is most probiotics are just four strains. And by the time they get to the colon, which is where you need them, they're all dead anyways because yeah. of the stomach acid and, and the transition. There are some newer kind of products that are coming to the market that um, are much higher concentration and they seem to have some benefit in terms of populating the colon. Mm -hmm. But I would rather do it from a natural source of uh, you know, healthy carbohydrates like greens, vegetables, asparagus, things like that, where you get more of the, the micronutrients as well, which are essential. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. And uh, you, you get them in a more balanced ratio as well, in a more natural yeah. way. And yeah, and I think, you know, you really want to go back to eating, eating real food, right. you know, not processed, not trying to hit your macros so you avoid carbohydrates completely. Um, you know, obviously, you stay away from the refined products and, and grains and, you know, legumes and stuff like that. But real food is, is where it's at. You know, you can get rid of 90% of your liver and still function. But if you get rid of one more percent, you have full-blown liver failure and you die. A lot of people do not uh, understand that being in ketosis doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to lose fat. Why is our insulin elevated? Why is our glucose elevated? We're just treating the number. And that I think we need to get away from and we need to start focusing on the underlying cause, which everything that you and I have talked about on this um, podcast. If you think about it, a lot of theories that are discounted in the past in the medical community come back around, you know, 50, 100, 200 years later. And for some reason, we realize, oh, you know what? That guy who was uh, saying this was actually right. The monks used to go and meditate and reach nirvana. Well, I'm, I'm assuming probably some of that nirvana is because they were in deep ketosis. They weren't eating.